Hey Instafam, it's Dr. T here coming to you at 7.30 Perth time on a Tuesday night. I know, it's rather late for me. <laughs> How are you guys? I hope you're really good. I had the most magnificent day. Before I get into it, because I've got a few questions that have been DM'd through, check this out. I just got to show you this. My girlfriend took me making scarves. I made a scarf today. Isn't this cool? I haven't ironed it yet. This is called marbling. It's so cool. I am not in any way creative, but maybe I am. <laughs> so I've got to iron this and then I've got to wash it in some fabric softener. It's a silk scarf and I will be able to wear it. So what do you reckon? I'm thinking it'll look good. <laughs> I'm probably going to need it in a little while because the hair's coming out. Am I rocking the scarf? <laughs> I'm hoping I'll be able to rock the scarf. <laughs> Alrighty. Now, questions, questions. Don't forget, you can drop them into the chat. Remember our rules for questions. Rules for questions. Um, make sure it's a nice generic question. Make sure that you don't give me your whole life story because I won't be answering your whole life story. Keep it nice and clean and be respectful. <laughs> so anything you want to ask about fertility, gynae, pop it in there. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have been um, sent through. Somebody asked the question, can I please clarify what I meant by mild to moderate endometriosis is overcome by IVF? Okay, let me try and make this understandable. So there's stages of endometriosis. There's stage one through to five. Um, some people term it sort of mild, moderate and severe. Um, but the big impact of endometriosis, just to go back another step, is that it causes inflammation in the pelvis. And that inflammation is thought from a fertility perspective to cause issues with implantation of an embryo, cause issues with egg or embryo quality, and of course, inflammation can cause scarring, which can block tubes and distort anatomy and so on. But the big impact is that inflammation. If you have a little bit of inflammation, it might not be too much that you can't achieve a pregnancy. It just takes a little bit more time of trying. If you have a lot of inflammation, it can be significantly impacted such that in some way you need to reduce the disease load um, before you can conceive with something like IVF. So in the mild disease category, there's probably not enough inflammation or not enough impact um, on things like uh, implantation or even embryo quality such that if you kind of use a technique to fall pregnant, that's going to significantly increase your probability of falling pregnant. We know with IVF um, success rates, say with a 35 year old woman would sit at around 40% versus spontaneously conceiving 35 year old, I don't know, 15 to 20% at best. So already you've kind of upped the ante. So often in the context of, of mild um, disease, you can achieve a pregnancy using IVF. Um, when you get to quite severe disease, and there's different schools of thought on this, but when you get to quite severe disease, you need to reduce the disease load because IVF itself is probably not going to overcome things. Um, so it might be you need surgical resection um, or it might be that you need medical suppression of that disease um, with medication before perhaps putting an embryo back in the cavity. So I think I'm hoping that clarified that question um, on that one. Somebody else has asked, great question actually, somebody else has asked the question um, about embryo grading and does that reflect the embryo being chromosomally normal? Great question, great question. Firstly, let's go back and look at well, what is embryo grading. So when we put eggs and sperm together, uh, firstly, the sperm must fertilize the egg and that then 
um, causes two cells, which then divide, 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 divide. So we go through an embryo development from uh, a, a zygote through to what we call cleavage stage, which is around about day three, right through to blastocyst stage, which is around about day five. And it's, it's that blastocyst that is the embryo that eventually will implant into the lining of the womb. Um, a very, very clever man, Dr. David Gardner, developed a system which many of us use to grade embryos called the, the Gardner grading system. <laughs> very clever. And what he uh, developed is a way of embryologists actually looking at those embryos under the microscope and grading them, giving them an A, B, like at school when you got a grade. And it's based on three aspects of the embryo. So firstly, how far along the development of a blastocyst it is. So is it early blastocyst? Is it an expanded blastocyst? Is it hatching or has it fully hatched out? And that is um, a grade from one to six. They also look at the uh, inner cell mass um, and they look at how nice and round and symmetrical the cells are. And then they also look at the cells around the outside called the trophectoderm. They're the cells that, that really burrow in and help make the placenta. And they're also given an ABC. So the inner cell mass gets an ABC and the trophectoderm gets an ABC. So eventually it'll be a number like, I don't know, 3AA or 4AA or 5AA or it could be 5BA or 5AB. So in most centres in Australia, we use the Gardner grading system and your embryologist will relay that Gardner grading system to you. There has been a lot of research done to show that, that a blastocyst, depending on its grading, a good graded blastocyst generally will have a much higher likelihood of being chromosomally normal or euploid. So lots of studies have shown that. However, it's not perfect. I and many other fertility specialists have seen terrible looking blastocysts become babies. And equally, many of us have seen beautiful looking blastocysts not fall pregnant or beautiful looking blastocysts actually have assessment chromosomally and they're actually deemed chromosomally abnormal. So we know that we could do better with assessing embryos. And so that's why many fertility specialists advocate pre-implantation genetic assessment or genetic testing of embryos to look at whether they are chromosomally normal or not. Um, and equally, there is lots of research going on around the world looking at non-invasive ways of assessing embryos. So time-lapse imaging, for example, um, there was a big push about 10 years ago to see if time-lapse imaging would be the panacea, the way that we would definitively be able to assess the embryo at every single time point from the moment of fertilization and determine through algorithms which ones were chromosomally normal and which weren't based on how they appropriately developed. Um, more recently, uh, scientists around the world are looking at the media in which the embryos are grown, the culture media, to see what sort of metabolites there are in there that could give us an indication if it's chromosomally normal or not. But generally speaking, and this is why some centres advocate not doing any other testing apart from assessing morphologically how they look under the microscope. Um, but generally speaking, the better the quality uh, of the grade, then the more likely that is to be chromosomally normal. So that was a good question. Um, someone else has asked me the question about, is it worth me taking 500 milligrams of metformin if I have hyperinsulinemia? Um, to help me conceive no proven diagnosis of PCOS. Very difficult for me to answer that because I don't know your specific situation, the degree of hyperinsulinemia. Have you been assessed as being um, sort of glucose intolerant? Um, and how someone told you you were or weren't uh, a diagnosis of PCOS. But generally speaking, the value of metformin is multiple. But um, metformin will act as an insulin sensitizer. 
and will certainly bring down someone's insulin. And we know insulin drives androgens. Um, and we also know that a hyperinsulinemic environment in the beginning stages of pregnancy can create this really um, abnormal endocrine environment which can impact on implantation. Um, whether or not 500 milligrams is enough for you, I guess you, you, we'd have to be evaluating your, your uh, personal situation. All right. Oh, Michelle, you have a great question. I'm going to come back to that. Hey, thanks for all the love, by the way, everybody. Really loving the love. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've come out of cycle two. I still have my hair, though I must say it is definitely thinning. It is definitely thinning. And I am pulling out chunks every day. So I am still coming. <laughs> I am considering whether or not just to shave it off. Because I'm loving my scarf really love the scarf. Uh, I want to be able to wear it. I should just wear it anyway. Uh, now, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I did surprise you guys jumping on here, didn't I? I didn't give you any notice. I have to tell you a little secret. It's my birthday tomorrow, so I thought I might have the day off. <laughs> Michelle, can you please clarify the embryo glue facts myths? Facts myths. Okay. Embryo glue. Essentially, embryo glue is hyaluronic acid which is, we know, a really, really important um, compound for promoting the adherence of embryos to the uh, endometrium and, and promoting implantation. And for a long while there, um, it's a fantastic name, isn't it? Fantastic name, Embryo Glue. I wish I'd come up with that. Um, but for a really long time there, we thought it was just a really great marketing ploy. <laughs> but there has been some recent evidence to suggest that when, thank you, thank you for the birthday wishes, um, that if you actually culture the embryos in Embryo Glue, it does actually improve implantation rates. Um, I, I think that we probably need some really good randomized control evidence, which we, we don't have great evidence, but certainly there is more of a lean towards uh, culturing and transferring embryos in embryo glue. Um, so yeah, hopefully that clarifies it. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it a myth. It certainly is an adjuvant. It is an addition that um, not everybody utilizes in their IVF cycles. And um, it, it may not be necessarily indicated first time around because it's an additional cost for patients, right? Like it's, it's, it's not an inexpensive um, thing to include, um, but certainly uh, if someone has not necessarily um, fallen pregnant after the first transfer, it's certainly something that could be considered. I would certainly consider it. Any other questions? I've had some good ones. My, my brain fog hasn't been so bad this week. It's been all right. I've been out of string sentences together. Any other questions, everybody? Any other questions? I've got to tell you one thing about chemotherapy that I kind of probably never realized before is how bad it makes everything taste. I, I was so excited to, to purchase myself a cheese and chicken toasted sandwich today and it tasted revolting. <laughs> I was devastated. I was so devastated. Nothing really tastes good. And then some things just taste really offensive. I find anything with butter in it, you know, things cooked in butter, Really offensive, horrible taste. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Any other questions, everybody? Anything else? Oh, everyone just posted them through to me. Well, I might have to call it quits. <laughs> I've probably been on long enough anyway. Um, thank you, everybody. Oh, here we go. Oh, Chantel. Not sure if my question came through or not about adenomyosis. Oh, um... You did ask me a question. Can you can you can you please post the whole question again in the chat? Um, to those until you do, I'll just bang on. Um, adenomyosis is the growth of the lining of the womb within the wall, within the muscle wall of the womb, and um, we are diagnosing it more and more. And it's not that I think the um, incidence is increasing. I think it's that the resolution of our ultrasound and the skill of our ultrasonologists 
is so much better now that we are documenting it more and more. And there are sort of different ways to categorize it. It can be diffusely within the wall of the womb. It can be in little pockets and it can even cause things called adenomyomas, which almost look, look like fibroids, but they're not. Often women will present in their fourth and fifth decade of life with sort of painful, heavy periods. But again, as I said, with good quality ultrasound, we're picking it up more and more. And I think Chantel's question, um, ah, is there any treatment if trying to conceive and having multiple miscarriages? So, uh, well, okay. So the first question really to ask is whether or not the adenomyosis is implicated in infertility or recurrent miscarriage. And I can put my hand on my heart and say that we do not have great quality evidence to suggest that adenomyosis is definitively involved in infertility or recurrent miscarriage. Certainly if it's say an adenomyoma that might be impacting on the cavity um, and causing inflammation in the cavity potentially. But the other issue with adenomyosis is it often comes in conjunction with fibroids and it often comes in conjunction with endometriosis. So which is the thing that's actually impacting the most on, on fertility and or miscarriage? We don't, we don't really know. There is some research that suggests that women who are symptomatic and therefore obviously have more severe adenomyosis, um, it may be more implicated. Now, how to treat it? How to treat it? Difficult, very difficult because it responds like endometriosis. It's under the influence uh, of hormones, uh, predominantly estrogen. And so you would treat it just like you would treat endometriosis in that you would often medically suppress it uh, using hormonal suppression. You can't cut this stuff out because it's diffusely within the muscle. And if you start cutting into the, the muscle uh, of the uterus, you're going to significantly impair the integrity of the uterus and you know potentially cause uh, late pregnancy effects such as uterine rupture. So um, we don't have a good surgical treatment for adenomyosis at all. Um, I, I do think it's something we're learning more and more about, but I mean, you know how little we know about endometriosis. We probably know even less about adenomyosis and how to manage it. Michelle, headscarf and matching glasses. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going shopping for my birthday tomorrow for headscarves. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a bag and a purse to match. Oh, somebody, Annie, to add, is there still a chance of natural conception? Oh, with adenomyosis? Absolutely, there is a chance of natural conception. Of course, of course, there is with endo, there is, there's always a chance. Hi, hope you're feeling well, thank you. Recently got results for progesterone, it's 16 nanomol, I'm thinking. Uh, can this be fixed? Well, it really depends um, on when your progesterone was measured. So... If you know exactly when you have ovulated, you would therefore be measuring your progesterone exactly seven days later for it to be a truly mid luteal level. So the most important thing really to, to first know is exactly when you've ovulated, um, when you get that LH surge, and then you'd be measuring the, um, yeah, so you get your LH surge 12 to 24 hours later, you ovulate, and then you want to be measuring your progesterone seven days later, so it's truly mid luteal. It may be that you've you've not actually ovulated when you think you have, and so what you're measuring there at 16 is not a true mid luteal level. So I think that's the first thing that you need to clarify. But certainly in fertility treatment, we do support luteal phase with added progesterone. Added progesterone. Is there a still a chance to conceive husband in cycle two for testicular cancer chemotherapy and has one move, one more to go? Um, yes. Okay. So it is not recommended. It is not recommended that you try to conceive whilst your partner is going through chemotherapy. Uh, we know that chemotherapy significantly uh, causes um, uh, chromosomal abnormalities in sperm. It, it's it's just not a recommendation to try and conceive whilst um, going through chemotherapy. We generally the the the, um, the age of a sperm. Oh, sorry, the 
development of a sperm happens over about 90 days. So we would recommend three to, to six months um, after completing chemotherapy, would you try to conceive? Um, and that's actually a Cancer Council uh, recommendation. So not a recommendation to try and conceive whilst you are going through, whilst your husband, partner, male partner is going through chemotherapy. Okay. Is there such a thing as having too thick of a lining before FET? Yes, Rach, there is, there is. We know that at an endometrium, 14 millimetres or greater is, is probably too thick. Um, we know that pregnancy rates decline. So, yep, good question. Um, Carolina, what are the, some of the main tips for pregnancy with MTHFR? Well, I'm going to tell you my position statement on MTHFR. Stop measuring it. <laughs> it really is inconsequential. Um, we don't think it has any implication on fertility, recurrent miscarriage or pregnancy outcomes. If you're homocysteine, if you have an MTHFR polymorphism, it's not a gene mutation, it's a polymorphism. If you have an MTHFR polymorphism and your homocysteine is plumb normal, then the whole folic acid processing cycle works just fine. So just be normal. Just be normal. Just be normal. If it's not, then you probably need to be seeing um, a hematologist. Okay. I think I'm done, guys. I think, I think I've just about stretched my brain <laughs> for today. Thank you for jumping on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I will see you next week. I'm going to have tomorrow off. Yeah. Last one in my forties. It'll be a good one. Fifties next year. <laughs> have a beautiful week. Please look after yourselves. Do something to fill your cup. Yeah. Make a scarf. Do something to fill your cup. Look after yourselves. Have a beautiful week. Live life to the plus and I'll see you soon.